Hello, everyone. Uh, today, I'll uh, take up a Linux session. Okay, so wherever we have uh, stopped in our uh, previous Linux class, we'll, we'll continue from there. So uh, I, I remember that we were actually talking about a particular Linux command called as uh, chmod. With the help of the chmod, it's possible to change the ownership, group ownership, and uh, uh, permissions on files. Now today I'll I'll talk about certain commands which are related to managing the hardware which is uh, actually present on your servers. So in order to do that, let me as always uh, go to a Linux server. We'll we'll try to start a Linux server on the AWS cloud. And on this particular server, we will work on those commands. So these commands are mainly related to the the capturing information about the hardware. It could be about your uh, disk free space or disk usage or how much memory is available. Uh, similarly, what are the processes which are running all that information? How do you actually terminate a process? So these are the, the kind of uh, commands I'll try to show you. So see, my server is uh, currently in running status. Let me connect to that server. Uh, I think there's some problem with the, the pen key. Actually, I renamed it on my computer. So this is the actual name now. Yeah. So you notice once I am connected to this particular server, I'll, I'll start with the commands which are related to the hardware management, as I told you. The first command is how do you capture the memory information of your server? We have a command called as free. Free will give you the, the memory related statistics. You see, by default, it shows in uh, kilobytes. So you see, this is the total amount of KB of uh, memory or RAM, which is present on this server, how much is used, how much is uh, free, how much is swap. Swap means in, in Windows terminology, you call it as virtual memory, right? Here on the Linux machine, they call it as swap. Now, if you want this output to come in uh, megabytes, you can give as hyphen M. So this is the 90, 946 MB of uh, total memory out of that 306 is used. So. Similarly, if you want to see in gigabytes, I, I can't show in gigabytes because uh, megabytes itself, you see, it's 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 so less. So it's not even one GB. So obviously, it, if I give in the G, it will come as zero. But if you have a much more high configuration server, obviously, you can see in gigabytes and whatever. But free is basically that 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 command which is showing you the the memory related uh, information. Similarly, uh, if you want to see uh, what is the partition structure of your Linux machine? Generally, on your Windows machine, you might have noticed that you have a, a C drive, D drive, etc. Right? Similarly, on, on, on your Linux machine, if you want to see the partition structure, generally, we give this command called as df-h. This will show you the, the partitions which are available. You see, uh, there is a file system called slash dev slash root, which is mounted on a partition called forward slash. So, I mean, you don't have those kind of fancy names like C or D. This is how the naming convention goes on a, a Linux machine. But this is the basic partition structure of my uh, Linux server. Similarly, if I want to see the disk usage, you have a command called du. So, for example, I want to, I mean, du command, if you give with the hyphen h, h stands for human readable format. And I want to specify, uh, for example, uh, what is the partition structure of, uh, I mean, what is the disk usage of a folder called etc. So is the etc folder, it seems the total folder is consuming 7.8 megabytes, out of which, you know, etc mod probe is consuming 44 KB. So the entire folder and within the folder, subfolders and files, how much storage space they are consuming, kilobytes or megabytes, whatever, you can actually see that information using disk usage command. Okay. The next command of uh, Linux that I want to talk about uh, is uh, how do you see the list of processes which are initiated by the user? I mean, as a user, and using this Linux server, there might be certain processes which I might have initiated. 
and that can be seen using this command called ps ps will show you the list of processes that i have initiated do you see there's a process called bash and of course at the run time of running this ps command the ps itself is shown as a process what is this bash generally this is how we talk about the linux architecture you have the hardware on top of the hardware your linux operating system is uh, actually uh, uh, it's it's a combination of uh, two layers the innermost layer of your linux operating system we commonly call it as the kernel and the outer layer is called as the shell generally speaking when you use the word linux os it is a combination of kernel and shell the, the entire stuff is called as the 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 os and bash is one such shell i mean there are different types of shells which are available for example there is something called as born shell okay this is represented using sh there is something called as corn shell and this corn shell is represented using ksh and there is something this is the most popular of all born again shell sorry yeah so you have something called as born again shell and this is what people call it as the bash shell so shell is just a interface between the user and the inner layers of your operating system whatever commands you are giving these commands are carried by your shell and it's 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 performed on the the os in fact in this particular linux server what are the available shells if you want to see there is a file called slash etc slash shells if you go into this it will show you the list of all the shells which are available on on this particular linux machine see uh, these are different shells of course i am using the the bash shell that that is the default shell that i am using but just understand that a shell is just an interface between the the linux kernel and the user okay and what it says is currently the bash shell is also initiated and at the time of uh, checking the list of processes ps command was also under execution so it's showing ps also now when my linux machine is running there is a possibility that i mean these are the processes that i have initialized but there are so many other processes which are running in the background those processes you can see using ps hyphen ef or you know uh, in most advanced versions of linux they have replaced that ps hyphen ef with ps aux any one of them you can use this will show you the list of all the processes which as a user you have initialized and the system initialized the very fact that the os is running simply means that certain processes are available those processes also if you want to see then we go with this command called as ps hyphen ef or ps hyphen i mean ps aux no need to use uh, hyphen when you are going with the aux if you want to use ef then you need to give the the hyphen uh, option but they give the same output similarly on on your windows machine when you want to see the live process tracking you have something called task manager right you go into control alt del i'm sure everyone knows that now the same thing on a linux machine you can see uh, with the help of a command called top top will show you the, the live monitoring of the processes where if you closely observe you will notice that these processes keep on changing the the amount of cpu the memory that is being used by these processes all that information keeps on coming up over here okay uh, the same top command output in in certain versions of linux can be implemented using another command called htop htop also is the live monitoring of the processes but it is showing you the same information in a, a much more colorful format uh if there is a process and you want to kill the process linux actually uses a command called as kill now this kill command is used generally in combination with two signals one is called as hyphen 15 and other one is called as hyphen 9 this is a very frequently asked interview question kill hyphen 15 and the second one is kill hyphen 9 i'll tell you what is the difference between both of them kill hyphen 15 is called as kill cleanly cleanly in the sense imagine I am deleting, killing a process called A, but this A process has initialized two child processes called as B and C. And now I'm trying to kill this A process. And for killing, I am using the hyphen 15 signal. What this kill 15 will do is, of course, it will kill the A process, but it will wait for the dependent processes, the B and the C processes to finish their job. Once they finish their job, then the kill hyphen 15 will uh, kill the, the A process, okay? So as an example, 
let's try it on the bash process itself. When we give ps command, we notice that uh, bash, bash is nothing but the interface. I told, right, it's an interface between you and the Linux operating system. The bash, in my case, is running with a process ID called 1127. So I want to kill it. How do you do that? Kill hyphen 15. I'll say 1127. So this is going to kill the bash process. Okay, it is going to kill the bash process. But since it's killed cleanly, nothing is happening. Apparently, I don't see anything happening because certain processes might be there which are dependent on the bash. And this kill hyphen 15 is waiting for those processes to finish their job. So apparently, it, it looks as if nothing has happened. On the other hand, if I again, okay, sorry. Uh, if I say ps command, sorry. When I give ps command, if I say kill hyphen nine and I give the same process ID, bash process ID, as you can see on my screen is 1127. When I do this, you will notice that it will close this process abruptly, uh, terminate it immediately, okay? And do you notice because the bash process is closed, the connection to that EC2 instance is also terminated and I'm back to my Linux server. I told you earlier that shell is nothing but an interface between you and the, the user. The moment the bash is closed, the connection to the server is lost and you are back to your, uh, your Windows machine. I hope you're understanding. So the kill command when you use in combination with nine, the same example I'll take, there's a process called A, which you want to kill but A has initiated B and C. In the case of kill hyphen 15, we saw that when you are trying to kill with that, it is waiting for the child processes to finish their job. Whereas in the case of kill hyphen nine, it won't wait for the child processes to finish their job. It will forcibly kill this parent process. And because the parent process is killed, these dependent processes will become what we generally call in Linux terminology as zombie processes. Okay, interviews, they'll ask you, what is a zombie process? This is a typical example. You have a parent process which was killed forcibly due to some reason. It's consuming huge amounts of CPU or memory. And until you kill that process, it's not possible for other applications to run. So forcibly, you're killing that process using the signal called hyphen nine. That, that con the consequent result of that is it is some child processes are there. Those child processes are becoming what are called as zombie processes. Okay. Now, the, the next, okay, let me reconnect to the same Linux server. Now, the next set of uh, Linux commands that I want to talk about come under a category which is commonly called as wildcard characters. Sometimes people also call it as regular expressions. I mean, regular expressions is the word which is generally used in uh, scripting languages like Python, etc. But here, ideally, we call them as wildcard characters. Now, there are basically four types of wildcard characters which are commonly used. The first one is that asterisk symbol. The second uh, wildcard character is a question mark. The third wildcard character is something given in square brackets. And the fourth wildcard character is something given in square brackets along with the cap symbol. So these four we commonly call as wildcard characters. These wildcard characters are generally used for performing group actions. Okay, I'll tell you what I mean by that. So let me come to the server. Uh, you notice I have some files over here. I want to delete uh, file one. So what is the command you give? You simply say rn file one. With this command, only file one gets deleted. But I would like to delete all the files which are starting with the word F-I-L-E. Afterwards, you can have anything, which means all these files I want to delete. File one, file 200, file four, file five, and file six. Then I will give file and that star symbol, asterisk symbol. As I mentioned earlier, asterisk symbol represents zero or more unknown characters, which means it will search for all those files which are starting with the word F-I-L-E, after which you can have anything. Zero or more unknown characters can be available. It's going to delete all that. Done. Now, if I do LS, you notice that all those files are deleted. It's not about RM command. Any kind of activities you can do. For example, I want to change the permissions or I want to move the files. Any activity you want to do on a group of files, 
which which could be split on different locations. In this scenario, my files were present in this location, but I can actually specify the path and they can be present at different locations. I want to do group activities. Then this wildcard character comes up. Okay, I'll take up another example to demonstrate this. Uh, wait, just to avoid confusion, I will delete necessary data from here. We have a directory, I'll delete that. I also have some files. So now currently there are no files, right? Let me create some files. I will ensure that the names of all my files are something like this. You see, if you do ls hyphen l, you can notice that I have three files. The names of the files are file one, file 12 and file abc. One thing that is common for all the files, it is starting with the word file. That's what I want. And you look at the permissions, read, write, read, write, read, which means in numerical format, you can call it as 664, right? Remember when I was talking about the chmod command, I told read is four, write is two, execute is one. This is what we told, right? So almost similar to that, I, I, I am trying to explain now. You can see that uh, chmod uh, I want to apply on all the files, which are starting with the word file. So I can give the command like this chmod maybe 770 on file star what is 770 read write execute for owner read write execute for group and others should not have any permissions that's the meaning of 770 right but for which files are you applying i'm applying it for file star which means the name of the file should start with a word called file after which you can have zero or more unknown characters so here you have one unknown character here you have two unknown characters, which are numbers. And here you have three unknown characters, which are some uh, alphabets. It's okay. It doesn't matter. It's going to work on all those files. Let me hit enter and show you. Now, if you do ls hyphen l, you will clearly notice that the permissions have been changed. See, earlier it was 664. Don't you notice now it became 770? But the interesting thing is it happened for which files? That is more important all the files which are starting with the word file because that star represents zero or more unknown characters now when i say zero or more unknown characters what do i mean i'll, I'll try to show with another example uh let me create some files like this i am creating the files in such a way uh let me just show you uh this is one file These are just file names, okay? Don't be confused with that. So, one thing that I have ensured is each and every file name is starting with the alphabet F and ending with E. In between, what is there? You don't need to worry. Sometimes you are having two alphabets. Sometimes you are having nothing. In fact, you see here, I just have a file with the name FE. In between F and D, you don't have anything. Whereas here I have a file where in between F and D, you have few alphabets and you also have a few numbers. Okay, it's okay. Now I will say move F star E into the temp folder. So what does that mean? It means that you want to move all the files where the the first character is f and the last character is e online candidates just give me a second please Sorry, friends, it was an urgent call, so I had to attend. Fine, anyhow. So basically what I was trying to explain over here is you can notice that I am trying to move all the files which are starting with the alphabet F and ending with E. In between F and E, you can have any number of unknown characters or you might not have any characters. Doesn't matter. See, 
this file name is just fe there's there's no alphabet or uh, number between f and d but still this this regular expression or wildcard character star applies that because star represents zero or more unknown characters which means there could be no characters or there could be one unknown character or two or 10 or 100 doesn't matter so all these files that you see here will be moved from the current directory into the temp folder let's hit enter now you see i don't have those files if I move into the temp folder, you notice that all those files have successfully moved here. Similarly, sitting in the temp folder, I'll say F star E. What does that mean? Remove. I just want to remove all the files where the name of the file starts with F and it ends with E. In between, I don't know what is there. Doesn't matter. So it's going to delete all that. So you see now, all those files have been successfully deleted. Understanding, move, chmod command, ls command, anything I can do with this kind of uh, stuff. Okay. And this regular expression, the, the asterisk that we are talking about, it could be at the middle of the file name or in the end or in the beginning, doesn't matter. Anywhere uh, it, you can use. Basic stuff is some kind of similarity in the file name should be there. Then we can use this. Okay. The second uh, kind of uh, wild char character that we generally encounter on line X is question mark. Question mark represents exactly one unknown character. Exactly one unknown character. Not more, not less. So let me demonstrate that. I will create some files where I will give the file names like this. I will say touch. This is the name of the first file. This is my second file. Now I have another file. I have another file. Something like this. Now you do ls on these files, you notice these are the files I have created. If I do ls hyphen l, but I'll say file question mark, you people know that ls hyphen l will show you the long listing of the files, the metadata. But for which files you want, I want to see the metadata only for those files where the name of the file starts with the word file, after which you can have only one unknown character. So out of the files which are available, out of the four files, which files do you meet or uh, which files do you think are meeting that criteria? This one and this one. That's it. This will not because after the word file, there are two unknown characters. And here you have three unknown characters. My regular expression tells I would like to do ls and l for all those files where the name of the file starts with file after which only one unknown character is should be there. So this one and this one, these two files metadata will be displayed. Do you notice that? only for file one and file A. Okay, let's take it like this. If I do one more time, I just do ls just to show you the list of files and I'll do ls hyphen L, but I'll give file double question mark. What is double question mark? As I told you, one question mark represents one unknown character. When you are having double question mark, it obviously becomes two unknown characters. So I will search for any file where the name of the file should start with the word file after which you can have exactly two unknown characters. See, exactly two unknown characters. That's it. So it will show you the metadata only for this file called as file 12 because question mark, one question mark represents one unknown character. When you are putting two question marks, obviously it becomes two unknown characters. See, only it's displaying information about file 12. I hope it's making sense and everyone is understanding. Okay. Now, it's it's not necessary that you have to use only one wildcard character. In one single scenario, I can use uh, both these things if I want. Something like this. Now, sorry. Ls hyphen L. This is the current, uh, you know, list of files with the metadata. But now I will say chmod change the permissions to 770, any, any values, just, uh, you know, I, I'm just taking all permissions for user and group, no permissions for others. For which file should I do? The file name should start with some unknown character, which I don't know. The next set of characters, the next three characters should be ILE, after which you can have, again, any unknown characters. Question mark represents one unknown character. So the first character could be anything, doesn't matter. The second, third and the fourth characters have to be I-L-E and the last set of characters could be anything. So basically it's going to work on all these four files and it's going to give the permissions as 770. See, do you notice that? The difference, okay? So in one single scenario, you can use 
as many number of uh, wildcard characters as you want in the beginning, in the middle, in the end, wherever you want. The next wildcard character is square brackets. Square brackets simply means in square brackets, whatever alphabets you are giving or whatever characters you are giving, only one character it will take into consideration. Okay, this is how it works. I'll create some files. As an example, I'll call the file as ALE. These are just file names, okay? Some, some weird file names I'm giving. Now, once the file names are given, I will give a command like this, do ls hyphen l for any file, which is like this. What does that mean? It means you want to do ls hyphen l on any file whose name starts with either a or b or c or d or e or f. The first character can be any one of these six alphabets. The next three should be ile. So which files do you think uh, will meet that criteria? These four files. Because the first character, only one unknown character, because the square brackets represents exactly one unknown character, and that one unknown character also should be within this range, A or B or C or D or E or F, and the second, third, and fourth will be ILE. So it's going to work on these four files exactly. See? Nothing else. Understanding? So same thing, chmod or rm, anything I want, I can use. On the same lines, we have one more wildcard character, which is uh, called as uh, cap symbol. You know what the cap symbol will do? Cap will is called as the reverse operation. Reverse operation in the sense, it will perform long listing of all the files where the first alphabet of the file should not be A or B or C or D or E or F. It could be anything other than this. And of course, the, the next three characters should be ILE. So which files meet the criteria? XILE and ZILE. Only on those two files, it will perform that activity. Let's check that. Do you see? So mainly these wildcard characters are extremely important, even from a DevOps engineer's perspective, because when you're working on Docker or Jenkins, we actually capture the logs into certain configuration files. And on these configuration files, we need to perform group activities. So you might use them in your Python scripts or you might use them in your shell programs anywhere, but it is necessary. So it's not difficult because only four wildcard characters. One is asterisk, which represents zero or more unknown characters. Next one is question mark, which represents exactly one unknown character. The next one is anything given in square brackets. Only one character is taken into consideration. And this is just the reverse operation. Whatever is given here, excluding that anything else can be there. That also is again only one character. Okay. Now, the next one. This is a, a slightly bigger concept. I am not sure whether we can finish it off uh, in today's session, but definitely we'll have, uh, you know, as we go with the sessions, we'll have one more Linux session where I talk about these things. User administration. On a Linux machine, if you remember in the first session of Linux, I told that if you want to see uh, who is the, who are the list of users, we have a command called as who am I, okay? I'm sorry. So what I was trying to tell is whenever you have created any user, that user information Linux actually stores in these uh, four files called as slash etc slash password slash etc slash group etc shadow and etc g shadow. Okay. We know that once you log in into a Linux machine, that user's information can be captured using who am I. 
but this is about the current user who is logged in. But on a Linux machine, any number of users will be there. All those users' information, it is storing in that particular four files which I talked about called slash etc slash password, etc group, etc shadow, and etc g shadow. And generally, the command that we use on a Linux machine for creating users is called user add. User add, and you can just give the name of the user. For example, I want to create a user called Rajesh. This command will create the user. When I hit enter, your error message. The error is, it says permission denied. It seems currently we are logged in as Ubuntu user. This Ubuntu user is not having permissions to execute commands like user add. In this kind of scenario, you can try giving a keyword called sudo. Sudo will temporarily give you higher permissions. Don't think that sudo will work every time. I mean, there is actually a file called slash etc slash sudo as file where you have to update the user's information. So in my case, the Ubuntu user information is updated, so it will work. In case it's not, you need to edit that file. So yes, the user got created. Once the user is created, if you want to set up a password for this user, we give the command like this, sudo password. What is the name of the user? Rajesh. So I can give whichever password I want. And the passwords have been successfully updated. Okay, so user creation and updating the password. Now, once the user is created, immediately you can notice this user information will be updated in the slash etc slash password file. Let's go and open that file slash etc slash password. Do you notice the last entry? This is the user that I have created, Rajesh. And this is the encrypted password. In fact, the slash etc slash password file contains seven columns of information. These are those columns. This is the username. This is the encrypted password. This is the user ID. This is the group ID. Here you can have a comment. Okay, I'll, I'll show you how to edit all those things. This is the home directory of the user and this is the, the default shell of the user. So all these seven parameters can be controlled by you. You can give whichever parameters you want, but it actually stores these seven fields of information. The user add command is doing that. Now, let us say, I mean, whenever a user is created, automatically it's assigning a user ID. I want to take that control into my hands. I want to create a user, but I want to specify what should be the user uh, uh, ID. So I can give the user add command. Let's say I want to create a, a user called as Malika. But for Malika, I will tell the user ID should be 2233. Done. Now, if you open slash etc slash password file, you notice that this is the user ID. So the default user ID, I am taking the control. Similarly, in these two quotations, generally people give comments about the user. So currently when I'm not giving, it's not showing any comment, but if I want to generate a comment for a user, you can do that. So I want to create a user called as let's say Radhika, and I want to give a comment. To give a comment, you give an option called hyphen C, and I'll say, okay, she is a normal user. This is going to provide a comment. Now, sorry, let's go to the same slash etc slash password file. And do you see a Radhika user has been created as expected. The comment is also given. Now, this is the home directory of the user. By default, it will be slash home folder. I can, I can change that to something else if I want. So, I'll create a user called Ravi. And for Ravi, I want the home directory to be something else. So I give hyphen D option. Imagine Ravi's home directory should be temp Ravi. Yes, this is what will happen now. The user called Ravi got created. And see, Ravi's home directory is TMP Ravi. Similarly, this is the shell of the user. So I want to control that. Uh, the default shell is given is born shell. I want to make it as bash shell. So... I am creating a user called as Robert. For Robert user, I would like to have the shell as bash shell. So I can just give in bash and you will notice that Robert user is created and his shell is bin bash. I mean, just to show you how these commands are working, I'm trying to give these things individually. But in fact, you can give all that in one single command itself. So you can give like this user add. Uh, imagine that... Uh, the name of the user is uh, 
This is the name of the user, Nikki. And here I'll say the user name for this person, the user ID for this person should be 555. Similarly, I want to give a comment for this user. The comment I want to give is this. Similarly, I want to tell the shell of this person should be bin bash. And what else? What are the other things we have edited? The home directory slash D. I want to give this as temp uh, slash. In fact, expiry date. You know, when you join an organization, your account would be created. Uh, keeping in mind, let's say you are working as a contract based employee and you are going to work till the end of this year. So they'll set an expiry date so that after that point, you can't use this uh, account. This was done using hyphen E. I want to say, okay, 31st, 12, 2024. Whatever date you are giving should be a future date. So after that date, this account will no longer exist on this server. So done. Now, if I go to the slash etc slash password file, you see, I created a Nikki user. This is the, the user ID. The same with the same name, a group gets created. So group ID also reflects the same thing. This is the comment. This is the, the home directory. This is the, the shell of that user. Okay. So uh, I think this is sufficient for today. Try to practice these commands. We'll wind up the session. Okay. Thank you so much.